Well, good morning, everybody. What a fantastic turnout for our International Women's Day conference. We have an absolutely full house. So there's standing room only. There's people up in the gallery. I can't really see you, but I know you're there. Morning, guys. Yeah, I'm seeing some waves. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm Marianne Campbell. I'm a Vice Principal for Research here at the University of Aberdeen. And it's my absolute pleasure and privilege uh, to be hosting this event this morning. I'm going to start with a couple of housekeeping uh, rules, as always the case, um, and then we'll, we'll get into the event proper. So just um, before we start, we don't expect any fire alarms this morning. So if it goes off, it's real. So there's uh, various exits around the building. There are many staff here today, so they will know the drill. They know where to go. So um, do follow and go out um, your nearest exit. Um, for any of you who haven't discovered the toilets yet, and given there's so many win women, I think there'll probably be queues. Oh dear, there are never enough toilets in the world. This is a women's problem. Um, but anyway, if you go out of here, you go right to um, the front entrance and you turn to your right as we look on the way out. So there are toilets there, um, and, and um, if you need it, please do go. Um, we have, um, for those of you who are on social media, this is an informal event. Please feel free to take photos, take selfies. This is the International Women's Day. We're part of a global uh, collaboration celebrating womanhood um, today. So um, we've got a couple of hashtags. They're up on the slide here. So um, for this particular event, we're IWD ABDN, so Aberdeen's International Women's Day. We also have the global hashtag, which is each for equal. So uh, get your phones out, get tweeting, go and create a buzz uh, around this morning. Um, we're just delighted to have that. Um, so as I mentioned, this, this is a global event um, and it's an opportunity uh, to help forge a gender equal world. Um, really to celebrate women's achievements and to raise awareness against bias that we come across um, on a daily basis. And um, here in Aberdeen, this is our seventh uh, university gathering um, around and celebrating International Women's Day. And it's wonderful for us um, who've been here over the years to see this grow and develop. I mean, it's just wonderful having a packed hall here today. Um, and, and one thing to say is it feels a little bit like we're sitting in the UN. It's very formal, a setting. You've all got microphones. And, um, but it's an informal event. Please feel free to contribute. You know, um, have a bit of dialogue with the speakers. We've got fabulous speakers coming today. And really, it's all about uh, integration, uh, collaboration. So do feel um, free to talk and ask questions. We're very grateful for the support of our sponsor, TACA. Um, and... Um, They've worked with our events team to support the whole programme today. And uh, each of you will have got a goodie bag as you came in. And in each, there's a selection of inspirational books. So have a look if you haven't looked in your goodie bags. Um, there's um, a selection of books uh, by women authors. Um, and these were also gifted by TACA for today. So again, inspirational stories, inspirational books um, to take home with you. TACA's support has enabled us to uh, keep this event free to attend um, and accessible and open to all. And we're also very grateful for the support um, from the Student Experience Fund uh, here at the University's Development Trust, um, which has also enabled us to uh, run this really important uh, event. So the timing of this year's celebration uh, is particularly apt for us here at the university. Uh, many of you are aware that just a couple of weeks ago we launched um, our new university strategy to shape our next 20 years. What are we going to do um, for the next 20 years, thinking ahead to 2040? Uh, and at the heart of that strategy is a commitment to being inclusive in all that we do, inclusive in education inclusive in our research, inclusive in all the projects that we undertake over the next 20 years. Hugely important um, for us as women as we come together on International Women's Day. And also today, I'm delighted um, to announce the, the launch of a new women's development network. 
here in the university. And this is designed to connect uh, all female staff, um, whatever your grade or uh, stage in career. Um, and it's got an exciting agenda of inspirational talks, training and events uh, over the months to come. So if you're interested to find out more, um, there's an information stall just in the hall as you came in. Uh, you can learn more about uh, the new research um, centre, which will pioneer the transformation also of women's health care over the coming decade. So take some time to visit the stalls outside, to get connected, join the network, listen uh, and find out more about women's health. And so all of this important work um, chimes really with the, the words and the aspirations of International Women's Day 2020. We're here to celebrate an equal world, which is an enabled world. So when there's equality, we can do things together and we can shine together. Today we have three absolutely wonderful speakers um, to come uh, and speak with us and we can learn from them. Um, they've achieved outstanding success in their respective fields. And we will be inspired. We were out for dinner last night, and already I'm just bubbling with excitement to hear what our speakers have to say. Just true, this should be a wonderful event. And I'm delighted that we have young people here from schools today. I can see a number of you here. This is fabulous. You are our future. You are our women leaders of the future. Don't tell it, let anybody tell you anything different. You are here to succeed and, and just suck it in today, all that fabulous inspiration that we'll hear. Um, so, um, we have the three speakers we have today are Professor Lindley Lord, who's Pro Vice Chancellor and President of Curtin University in Singapore. We've got Gail Kent, um, who is Global Policy Lead at Facebook. And we've got Linda, Dr. Linda Papadopoulos, who is one of the most recognisable and well-respected psychologists working in the UK today. I'll tell you a little bit more about them as they come to speak. Um, but um, So without further ado, I'm going to give you a little bit more introduction uh, to our first speaker, who's Professor uh, Lindley Lord. Um, and as I mentioned, she is Pro Vice Chancellor and President of Curtin Singapore. And prior to appointment in Singapore, she was based at Curtin University in Perth, Australia, where she chaired um, the academic board and was also a member of University Council for six years. Uh, she co-led um, Curtin's Athena Swan project and was director of the Maureen Bickley Centre for Women in Leadership uh, at the Faculty of Business and Law. She was the inaugural uh, academic director for the Curtin Leadership Centre and she was leading the development of co-curricular student leadership projects. And in Singapore, uh, where Lindley is now, she chairs Education Services Interest Group um, for the Singapore International Chamber of Commerce. And she's also a member of the Australian Women in Business Group. And her research interests have been focused on gender and leadership and she has presented her research at major international conferences uh, all around the world. And in two, 2015, uh, the book she co-edited, um, Case Western Women in STEM Careers Increasing Workforce Participation Through Organisational Individual Strategies. So this won the Commonwealth Business Women Award uh, publication of that year. So top drawer inspiration here for us all. So she regularly contributes to um, and consults uh, with industry, particularly in relation to new models of leadership, women on boards and women in STEM. And, and for any of you who don't know that terminology about STEM, this is all about science, technology, engineering and mathematics, which we know is particularly difficult um, to, for women to um, have a full integration uh, in those subjects and also career progression. So we're absolutely delighted. Lindley, would you like to come up to the platform and share your thoughts with us? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thank you for that very warm welcome. And I'm really delighted to be here today to uh, join with all of you to celebrate International Women's Day though I do have to say it's slightly colder than Singapore, where I, 
I live, but uh, you have put on very good weather for me uh, the few days that I've been here, so thank you for doing that. Um, I've been actively involved in gender issues and gender equity for most of my working life, both as a practitioner and in more recent years as an academic. I'm both encouraged by the progress to date that's been made in relation to women's rights, but I'm also disappointed about the overall slow pace of change. We've been looking at these issues for a long time and that for some women, little or no change has occurred over the past 25 years since the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action was adopted in 1995 at the Fourth World Conference, Conference on Women in Beijing. And I was fortunate enough to be part of a university delegation that was at the um, NGO forum um, that was part of the uh, Fourth World Congress, um, a fantastic and exciting uh, event. The Beijing Platform for Action is recognised as the, the most progressive roadmap for the empowerment of women and girls everywhere. But UN Women state, and I'm quoting, that the emerging global consensus is that despite real change, is that despite some progress, real change has been agonisingly slow for the majority of women and girls in the world. Today, not a single country can claim to have achieved gender equality. Multiple obstacles remain, unchanged in law and in culture. Women and girls continue to be undervalued. They work more and earn less. They have fewer choices and experience multiple forms of violence at home and in public spaces. For, furthermore, there is a significant threat of rollback of hard-won feminist gains. Despite such a sobering view, I do remain optimistic that working together we can achieve lasting change. I do think we all have a role to play in challenging assumptions, including beliefs about who can be a leader, who should be a leader, which jobs are more suited to men, which jobs are more suited to women, and how careers are built and maintained. So as part of challenging assumptions today, I want to talk about confidence, particularly in relation to women's careers. Women's lack of representation in senior roles is often explained as their lack of confidence. That is, if only women were more confident, the problem would be fixed, or at least fix itself. I think it is true that some women do lack confidence in themselves. But today I want to argue that women's more serious lack of confidence is in the systems and structures that are embedded in our organisational practices and that our focus has to be on addressing these systemic issues, not on fixing women. Some of you may have experienced this. I thought that uh, captured it quite well. So we are seeing some changes We've seen the rise in women's voice regarding such issues as sexual harassment and sexual assault. Practices that were long-standing and known within particular industries or sectors, within industries, have had a light shone on them, which has shown that rather than such actions being rare or isolated, they were actually really common for many women, regardless of sector, colour, status. Women in Mexico and in India and elsewhere are protesting about the violence against women and girls. There's a rallying call for institutional and societal change. Papua New Guinea, which is just north um, of the east coast of Australia, there's a 97% chance, if you are female, of <laughs> domestic violence, sexual assault, those sorts of crimes, 97%. We need to work to change that. The Global Gen Gender Gap report, the 2020 report, states it's going to take us 257 years to close the gender gap in terms of economic participation. I think that's too long for us to wait. I think we need to change that much more quickly. Of concern is that in the 2019 report, it was 202 years. 
some things are getting worse. Globally, only 55% of women aged 15 to 64 are engaged in the labour market, as opposed to 78% of men. And in 72 countries, women are still barred from opening bank accounts or obtaining credit. So, will women increasing their confidence address these issues? My view is much more is needed than a confidence boost. We have been told to lean in, to be more confident, to be more ambitious. Oh, but not too ambitious. We don't like women who are too ambitious. Just a little bit of ambition could be good. Um, to fake it till we make it. Now, some of this advice, I think, is helpful to address particular career barriers, but it's not enough, and it positions women as the problem to be fixed, or at least changed enough to fit in to existing cultures. Jenny Hubler and her colleagues in their study on women's managerial aspirations found that women are less likely to receive critical on-the-job development opportunities. And this, they argue, rather than lack of confidence or self-belief, contributes to their underrepresentation at a senior level. I don't think confidence is necessarily going to fix that. So let's look at pathways to leadership. I'm going to focus on a couple of areas that uh, I've been working in, um, and I'll just share some of that work. This is work I'm doing with colleagues. Firstly, to look at women's pathways to corporate boards, and secondly, at women's academic careers. The focus is on the Australian context, but I'm hoping that some of that will resonate with you, because I think there are some issues that we share, regardless of context and location. So in terms of the path to leadership roles for women, it's rarely straightforward. We can encounter glass ceilings, those invisible barriers that prevent us from reaching senior levels. Sticky floors that trap women into service roles or low paying occupations that do not result in leadership opportunities. The jobs that women are good at. You're so good, we need to keep you in that role rather than give you opportunities to move into more senior roles. Maternal walls that surround women who are or who become mothers, often preventing them from accessing career-enhancing opportunities. Or, increasingly, women can end up in glass cliff positions, those precarious leadership roles that become available in times of crisis or economic downturn, but where the chance of failure is high. Think about some of the women who end up in uh, leading countries, often in times of crisis, um, same happens in organisational settings. So the pathway is not straightforward, and as Alice Eagley and Linda Carley have suggested, it's more like a labyrinth, full of twists and turns, and sometimes a few dead ends. I think another challenge is the expectations that we have of women leaders, both women and men, have a view about who should be a leader. So when women do get into leadership roles, they're afforded a much narrower range of acceptable behaviours. They're expected to be more communal than their male counterparts. That is, they're expected, we are expected, to be more caring, to be helpful, to be nice. And then we're criticised for not being agentic enough. That is, we're criticised for not being decisive, being goal-oriented, being assertive. However, if we are decisive, goal-oriented and assertive, we're criticised for not being communal enough. Where do we find that middle ground? As Amanda Hunter noted, women politicians fighting it out for the Democratic nomination at the American presidential campaign have a different expectation placed on them than their male counterparts. I don't think this is just an American issue, but it's a very current one. Elizabeth Warren was criticised for the way she questioned Michael Bloomberg regarding allegations that his company was a hostile workplace for women. She was criticised for being mean, angry and nasty. 
for asking those questions. They're not qualities women are expected to display as leaders, and if they do, then by implication, they shouldn't be aspiring to those leadership roles. I'm not sure how many of the men, in terms of their behaviour, have been described as mean, angry, nasty. They're particularly uh, gendered words, I think, in terms of being applied to women. So how do we get started on our career to leadership? Well, it remains challenging for us. The McKinsey Lean-In study looked at 329 companies employing some 13 million people and found it was that first step into management that was delayed for women. And this then compounded over the life of their career. They termed this broken run as the biggest systemic barrier to achieving gender equality. So it's not a level playing field. Once women do start up the managerial ladder, they continue to find it harder pro to progress at the same rate as their male colleagues. McKinsey's uh, 2016 Women in the Workplace report found that women negotiate for promotions and salary increases as often as men. Often we're told, well, women don't earn as much because they don't negotiate. But here's a study that tells us, yes, we do. But they face more pushback when they do. We also receive uh, informal feedback less frequently than our male colleagues, despite asking for it as often. We have less access to senior level sponsors. And what they state in that report is, not surprisingly, women are almost three times more likely than men to think that their gender will make it harder to get a raise, a promotion, or a chance to get ahead. So just going to touch on some of the research that we've been doing with some colleagues in um, Australia. And Women on Boards has been a national debate in Australia. It's been a national debate here in the UK and in other countries. And a number of countries have enacted quota legislation and others like Australia have a comply or explain provision. However, despite the gains that have been made, progress appears to be stalling, particularly for women at the executive level. Sue Vinicom and her colleagues at Cranfield University noted in the 2019 Female FTSE 100 report that the percentage of female non-executive directors was at an all-time high, some 38.9%. I think what's interesting is we get really excited about 38.9%, you know, nearly 40%, and we forget to say that means 60% of the positions are still held by men. So we also need to always look at that other side of it. But what they found was that the percentage of female executives remains worryingly low at 10.9%. So those positions that will lead into boards. And they also found growing evidence that once women are appointed to boards, they have significantly shorter tenures, less likely to be promoted into senior roles. So Alison Sheridan at the University of New England and Anne Ross Smith at Macquarie University and I have been looking at pathways to boards in the Australian context. We've interviewed um, board chairs and women board members of the top 50 companies in Australia in 2010 and in 2016 and 17. One of the differences that we noticed over that time, because there had been that debate, which is why it's important to continue to have events like this to talk about these issues, was the, increasing, the increase in women's gender capital. With the pressure on the listed boards to demonstrate more diversity, suitably qualified women were actively being sought because they were women. That is, their gender capital had become a valued factor leading to their appointment. Our concern is this may be a transient phase rather than signalling embedded lasting change. We've also recently undertaken interviews as part of a pilot study with women who could be considered to be in that pipeline for board appointments, women who are in the executive levels of the top 100 companies. Um, it's a small study because the numbers of women are small across those uh, positions. But one of the interesting findings in today's talk, and uh, it's in the blockages, and I'm not going to go through all of those uh, results, is that the system that these women are working in breeds self-doubt. That issue of 
confidence in the systems and the structures. They reflected, amongst other things, that throughout their career, they had felt the need to work much harder than their male counterparts to, in order to be able to prove that they were as good, they were equal. It was not a question of skill or competence, but a question of perception. So another area of my uh, research interest is women's academic careers. And so just going to share some um, of the work that we've been doing around the trajectory programs that we have been running in the university. But I wanted to draw your attention to this study that uh, has just come out of New Zealand. I think it's really important, and many of you here with academic careers um, know that academe is not necessarily a level playing field. The recent New Zealand-based study uh, is based on their globally unique data set collected by their performance-based research fund which tracks and scores every individual's academic performance in terms of quantity, quality and impact. I think these results are really disheartening. It appears not to be a question of merit, but a question of gender. But without such research and our willingness to engage with these results in meaningful ways and to seek to understand the underlying structures that lead to these outcomes, then change and real change is unlikely. I think what we often do as academics when results like this come out is rather than actually engage with the debate, we engage with the, was that method really accurate? Was that the best way to do? Was that analysis really uh, right? And we, we are critical of the work rather than what the work is showing us. And so I think we have a responsibility to challenge around what that work is showing us. So, in the Australian context, women remain underrepresented in senior roles in Australian universities, women making up just 25% of those at professorial level. And similar to the UK, we've had a number of national initiatives. And I think these have been um, really good at promoting some systemic change. The SAGE Athena Swan program is based on the UK's Athena Swan program and it was launched in Australia in 2015. And Curtin was part of that pilot program. And, and uh, as you heard, I was one of the co-leads on that. I think what is really valuable about the Athena Swan initiative is it doesn't ask you to report on the data. It asks you to explain why you have got that data. That's a very different question. It's very easy just to report the data and go, this is the story. Explaining why you have no women in some departments in your engineering faculty, why there have been no promotions for women over the last five years that we were looking at the data, that's a harder question, and, but a really good question to pose to the organisation. We've had Lisa Harvey-Smith, uh, who is an astrophysicist, appointed as Australia's first Women in STEM ambassador. Amazing, amazing uh, person. I said in, uh, to one of the groups, uh, I think yesterday, she made me believe I could be an astrophysicist. She's such a fantastic communicator. Um, that's just me being delusional. There is no pathway to astrophysics for me. Um, but her role is to lead government efforts to encourage girls and women to study and work in STEM fields. And the government has the Women in STEM Decadal Plan which identifies barriers at every level of career progression from school through to senior organisational level. Whilst the focus has been on women in STEM, the requirement to look at organisational practices and outcomes has meant a deeper understanding of career barriers and enablers across all of our disciplines. So to address the lack of senior women in Curtin, and at the time that we uh, developed this program under direction from our Vice-Chancellor, uh, Curtin had the lowest uh, number of women professors in Australia and the lowest number in our uh, group of technology universities. So you can, you know, the pessimist can go, this is really dreadful, I'm an optimist, you go, what a fabulous opportunity. We can make a real change here. So with my colleague, Dr. Dorothy Wardale, 
um, we developed this program for senior academic women. Um, and this was the first program that was developed as part of the trajectory framework. And our aim was to provide career and leadership development opportunities in concert with identifying structural barriers to academic women's career development. We were not fixing women. We were engaging with women about how to fix the system. Some of the key design features included the head of faculty nominating the participants, involvement, engagement, and engagement with senior executive and uh, the senior executive, peer mentoring, alignment with the key institutional career activities, promotion, career conversations, and making gender visible. For some of the women, particularly in, in very uh, being like the only woman in their department or one of few, what they thought was happening was just them individually. They weren't good enough, they weren't trying hard enough. Bringing them into a much bigger group and talking about these issues that was a shared experience. It was gender-based. And so therefore, how do you address that? How do you change that? And that really helped them in terms of rethinking their career and what they wanted to achieve. Not expecting you to uh, read all of this, but just wanted to show that the framework that we're embedding is really looking at developing leaders from early career stages through research leadership, senior academic roles, and at the executive levels. It's a work in progress, and we're undertaking research as part of that to ensure we have a clear understanding of what are the individual issues for women, what are the curtain-specific issues, and what are sector issues? Where do we need to put pressure? Where do we need to apply um, uh, influence? So, just some of the results, and I'll share these with you uh, fairly quickly. We asked what had helped getting you to your present level in the organisation. So we often focus on what's wrong, not what are we doing right. I think it's always important to ask what's working so that you maintain that and you enhance that as well as addressing some of those blockages. So they talked about their own personal drive and ambition and their purposefulness. Uh, being prepared to take on leadership roles, their networks, their increased confidence about their ability to be a leader. The barriers included, for some, being actively discouraged from seeking promotion, being told that there were younger men who needed that senior role more than they did, was uh, an example. Um, not negotiating some of things like workload, salary, and then finding that there were others who were doing less and or earning more. And for some, there was some fear around the demands of leadership role, just not being prepared to take that on, and a lack of role models. At a systemic level, um, it was really, I want to just draw your attention that for many of these, it's two sides of the same coin. The barriers and enablers, the systemic issues. So, Line management is up there. Line management was either a fantastic enabler or an absolute blockage. The reason it's listed as a systemic issue was in fact, we put people into leadership roles and don't provide training. We don't provide support. We don't have discussions around gender issues in the institution to the depth that we should be. So for me, that's why that becomes a systemic issue. We also found um, this issue of precarious work, increasing casualisation of workforces, and for some women who were on um, visas that required work, you know, them to be uh, continuing their work, they were being threatened that if they didn't take on extra work, then their contract wouldn't be renewed and they'd have to leave the country. That's pretty serious stuff um, to find in, in your own organisation but you have to ask the questions and then you've got to be prepared to do something about it. So do programs like this make a difference? Well, this is the first cohort that we, uh, we tracked and we're continuing to track other cohorts. Of the 25, we asked them three months after, what's changed for you? Of those who were eligible, 10 had applied for promotion and there'd been an 80% success rate. Two had taken on a senior role, four had taken on a leadership role. Three had won an external funding grant, 
five had become mentors, one had found a mentor. And that has continued. Some of that first cohort are now in very senior roles in their faculty, having a, a really um, amazing impact. And their success is due to their own efforts, as well as organisational awareness of the need to examine and change systems and practices. Increasing the number of women at professorial level is an organisational KPI. It's part of our strategic plan. We are unapologetic about it. And discussions at senior level about the need to ensure we really do have the best talent to achieve our uh, strategic objectives has meant a more organisationally mature discussion about the need for structural shift. We aren't there yet, but we've come a long way. And I'd like to finish with a reminder from colleagues of mine in the US, Deborah O'Neill and Margaret Hopkins, of the need to continue to focus on the systemic issues. They remind us that a focus on individual level issues, that is women lacking confidence, women opting out, detracts from the work that must be done at the organisational level in order to dismantle the systems of pervasive structural disadvantage facing women seeking to advance to senior leadership positions. So it is a question of confidence. And I'm confident that if we continue to work for systemic change, then we can be hashtag each for equal and we can look forward to a more just world for all of us. Thank you. Wow, wonderful um, way to start the morning. Um, we do have a panel discussion later, but um, I think it's really important that if you've got questions about this fantastic talk from Lindley, that we take it. We've got some five minutes maybe to um, have a number of questions, um, and then we can save any others for the panel. So we've got a question over here. Hi, thank you. Um, speaking of systemic change and institutional change. Is, um, was this an exclusive event only to women? No. So no. there must be at least one or two blokes working at TAC or at university. And I think, I think one of the challenges is that it's been positioned as a women's issue and a women, women have to fix this problem. We have to fix this problem of us not being in senior positions, of us not earning the same amount of money. And that's bringing it back to, no, it's a systemic issue. So one of the questions we have to ask is, why don't men come? And often when men do come to events like this, they'll talk about how uncomfortable they feel and they're not sure if they should be here. I think what's interesting is when you talk with women who've had for a lot of their career been the only woman or one of few women, we're so used to that that we've stopped seeing it. So it's a good reminder for us but I think it's also a great experience for men um, to actually feel what we feel, to have a frame of reference of, oh, this feels a bit uncomfortable. Am I, am I allowed to speak? Am I allowed to, to say something? So I think that's a challenge moving forward for future events like this. How do you bring men into the conversation? Otherwise, it just continues to be our problem um, and we can't fix it on our own, nor should we. Thank you. No, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions at this time? And I have to remember to look up as well. Um, I don't think I'm being waved at from up there. Um, can I ask a question, actually? I was struck by um, when you mentioned that um, it, the perception is that women have a narrower mm. set of mm. so-called acceptable behaviours. Um, how do you think we should go about challenging this type of um, reaction collectively? That's a very good question. Wish I wish I had the answer. I think some of it is about being true to ourselves and our values. Um, it's about not looking to please everyone and make everyone else happy and comfortable. Um, you know, it goes back to the Elizabeth Warren example of. Um, you know, being brave enough to state what needs to be stated, to ask those questions and to be firm and not take that backlash personally. 
I think one of the things that we often do is we take that on as a personal criticism and therefore, oh, I won't do that again. Oh, that's, um, and I think what we have to do is go, this is a value statement. I need to address this issue. I need to raise this and I will do it professionally and people will understand where I come from. And then, you know, I talk about, you know, I have a plastic raincoat. It's an invisible one. And when I'm going into one of those meetings that I know is going to be hostile, and I've worked in gender issues for a long time, I've been in a lot of hostile meetings, um, I put my raincoat on. So that means they can hurl whatever they like at me, and I know it's just sliding off. It's not getting here. Because I, I used to get it here. It doesn't mean I'm not disappointed. Um, those sorts of things, but it's, I'm not personalising it, so therefore I'm not then modifying and like, oh, I shouldn't raise that issue, it might upset someone. So I think it's about knowing who we are, knowing what our values are, and really holding on to that. Amanda. Hi, Lily. Um, I think we touched on this on Wednesday when we were speaking, but do you think there's a responsibility for academia and institutions to have an equal responsibility to train their men? Um, in leadership roles so we don't self-perpetuate the same thing over and over again. It's all right training the women to be more confident and be visible in meetings, etc. But I think there's something about the other side of actually training the men as well. Absolutely. I don't think we have mature conversations around gender and the impact very often in our organisations. And often for men, there's not a frame of reference for the experiences because the systems and structures have been built for them. Just a little aside that's not really answering your question. I'm not mic'd up today. Why is that? I'm wearing a dress. What are mics built for? Men in suits. So, you know, it's some of those where... So why would men think about that? Unless, you know, there are some that wear dresses, that's fine. They'll be aware of it. Most won't be aware of that. So to get really angry at them and that is, is unfair. To have a discussion, to say, there's a design issue here. We need to fix this. To talk about the fact that you can have two CVs that are exactly the same with just the name different on the top and both women and men will rate women more lowly and question those achievements more. Those sorts of discussions. So absolutely, I think it's a leadership issue. I think it's an organisational responsibility to provide effective leadership training that addresses gender and diversity at a deep level, not a superficial level. So, yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. We, I think we'll hold yes. all our other questions for the panel, but um, can we just finish by thanking Lindley? Really inspirational spark to the day. Okay, and, and actually on that note, I should actually welcome the men who have come today. Thank you. Um, it's really important, I think, that um, it is owned, it's open to all, including men. And I think it's, we do thank you for coming today um, and, and, and hope you feel welcome. Um, so let's move on then to our second speaker. Um, so uh, Gail Kent um, was born and brought up in Glasgow um, and a school trip uh, to Germany in 1989 kicked off a, a passionate relationship with Europe. And uh, the Brexit referendum, I really wish we hadn't had to mention that today, but we have to, made her want to do something uh, about the state of UK politics. So Gail decided to get involved and stood for Parliament in 2017 uh, to continue a fight uh, for a Britain that's open, tolerant and united, where we're stronger uh, when we try and find uh, the similarities between us rather than through promoting fear. Gail ran in Dulwich in West Norwood in South London, where she'd lived for almost 20 years. Um, Gail has spent 17 years working for the UK National Crime Agency, uh, where she saw every day uh, how important international cooperation is for keeping us all safe. And she served for four years uh, at the UK Embassy in Rome, um, tackling the mafia, money launderers and people traffickers. And now she works for Facebook. I don't know what's worse. <laughs> 
And uh, after, only a joke. Uh, after a few years focusing on helping law enforcement around the world uh, understand Facebook, she now focuses on talking to governments about how technology is changing privacy, safety, and security. Fascinating. Gail, welcome to the stage. I always feel there's so many reasons that people can boo me for being in politics or law enforcement or working for Facebook. Um, but it's, it's a massive privilege to be here today uh, to tell you my story. And I, I don't see that lightly at all. It's one of the biggest human needs to feel connected, to feel listened to and to feel understood. And today I say that literally. As somebody that often speaks internationally, you don't know how nice it is to know that 50% of you are going to understand my accent. And the other half are saying, oh my God, what's so difficult to understand about her English accent or worse, Edinburgh accent. But as we heard from, she heard from Professor Campbell, I'm from Glasgow. So my family in Glasgow is laughing and crying at my accent. I'm really sorry, Glasgow, that I've lost the accent. But it's also a huge privilege to be here during uh, the university's 525th um, anniversary. Um, I now live in California and you can imagine what 525 years feels like to them. Um, but also to be, to be following two really eminent um, academics in, in your field. And, and Professor Campbell, it makes me feel a huge deal better that there are people like you leading on health research and also Professor Lord, that there are people like you leading on, on academia and, and, um, and women in the workplace. Not least of all in the historically notoriously sexist field of, of academia and of STEM. And that makes me feel like I've got a huge amount of affinity with you because as you've heard, I've spent most of my career in, in male dominated fields. I spent a lot of it in law enforcement. I've run for a political office um, and I work in academia. I continue to work in academia and I will now work for one of the world's um, biggest and best known tech companies, Facebook. You can boo at that point or you can ask me lots of questions <laughs> afterwards. Um, and in fact, part of the reason I left law enforcement was because of Sheryl Sandberg and because I, I really wanted to work in an environment that I felt um, supported women. Um, and today I'm going to share uh, my story with you about how I landed up and ended up doing this, like what is a fascinating, frustrating, stimulating position, thinking not just about Facebook, but we also have Instagram and WhatsApp and our relationships with, with governments around the world. And I'm going to talk about contradictions. I'm going to talk about contradictions in myself that have at times helped me and that have at times hindered me. And I'm going to talk about how I've come to largely embrace these contradictions and use them to challenge my own and others' perceptions. And hopefully, as this quote shows by Nikita Gill, who's an Insta poet, um, that that sort of whole mess of contradictions makes us beautiful people. It makes us whole. It makes us more interesting. But before I talk about my contradictions and how I deal with them, and hopefully some of that will resonate with, with you in the room, I'm going to talk a bit generally about contradictions and how that feels like from a feminist point of view. And I think that's really going to sort of tee off what the last conversation you were having about how do, we, how do women deal with these things. And what we know is that women, um, much more than men, struggle with contradictions. Like It's a form of internal conflict. And we know that women, more than men, don't like conflict. And that's probably a good thing. And we tend to, uh, tend to work on more constructive behaviour rather than men who sort of tend to dig in. And I've also got an Australian uh, report from the University of Adelaide. And this was looking at veganism, but it also looked at the wider sort of system of beliefs and it pointed to the fact that when women hold two incompatible beliefs, we're more likely to change our behaviour, to reconcile them, whereas men, by comparison, tend to dig in. So as we see here in Caroline Semler, that women say, I'm going to modify the behaviour. The problem is with me, and I'm going to accept responsibility for that. And that might sound familiar to all of you. We don't, we don't want to do that. We want to be internally consistent. And it's not just that we police ourselves. We undoubtedly do that. Um, but as Lindley showed, there's also this sort of great societal expectation on what we do. And I think we saw that this most recently in, in Caroline Flack and how she was expected to behave. She was only allowed to be the sort of bubbly Love Island presenter. She wasn't allowed to be the complex individual that, like all of us, that, that she was. And actually, I don't think that the same standards apply to, to men at all. 
Um, in a recent Guardian article, Helen Lewis said that when men are, are complicated, um, they're, they're called colourful, and we'll come back to that right at the end. But in women, the world used is difficult. And difficult women are ones that are, that are seen to be like one-dimensional, or sorry, ones that are refused to be one-dimensional in the way that they, they embrace life. And interesting that, that you talked about the glass um, cliff, because uh, in the end of... Um, yeah, um, about women being put in difficult roles. Like the most famous difficult woman uh, recently was, was Theresa May. And I, you know, she was definitely on that, on that glass cliff. Um, and I don't think that she was, she was lacking. I don't think just because she was, she was having that external um, contradictions and conflicts that that meant she wasn't having the internal ones. I think we saw right at the end that those internal struggles uh, were still there. But when I was thinking about, uh, about contradictions, I was thinking back to some of the work that I did um, on the Mafia and how um, it made me think of actually an, an Aberdeen case that I investigated when I was at the National Crime Agency. And, it, and I may, some of you might know this story. Um, it still seems a bit extraordinary to me, but there was actually a, a group of, like, of Mafia fugitives, so the, the real the Al Pacino godfathers, um, who were living and hiding out in, in Aberdeen, but still actively involved in, in crime in Naples. And I could say it was like the, um, it was like a sort of, uh, the real life version of the TV series Gamora, or you know, the book if you've read it, but actually it was not the real life, it's not like the real life version, it was the real life version. If you read the book Gamora in chapter five, you'll see that they talk about this particular family. But I was halfway through my, my law enforcement career, I was in Italy, and I was handed a file by the Italian anti-mafia squad, and they wanted me to help them find um, a notorious Camorra boss called Antonio Latore. And they believed that he was hiding out in Aberdeen. And you can imagine sort of like 10 years ago, what it was like, or 15 years ago, going and seeing this to, it was Grampian Police at the time, not Police Scotland. And they were like, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, definitely. We've got, we've got, we've got those mafia fugitives here. It's like, no, we, you really do. Um, and like, but why on earth, if you're a mafia fugitive, why on earth would you come to Aberdeen? It's cold, it's wet, it's dark most of the year. If you're going to be hiding out, you're not going to go to the Caribbean and you're not going to go to the south of France. Um, and as an Italian uh, as a prof mafia prosecutor said to me, it's probably not for the food or the weather that they've come to, to Aberdeen. Um, although after last night, I'd say it could be, very well could be for the food. Um, but the actual answer was love. Um, Antonio Latore had met a Scottish woman. We all know that Scottish women are the best, so he'd met a Scottish woman uh, and he'd fallen in love with her and he'd, he'd come back to, to Aberdeen. And this brings me back to, to contradictions. Um, you probably all know the stereotype of, of mafia men, of mafia bosses. They're ruthless, they're violent, but paradoxically they really love their family whilst placing them in constant danger. Um, and that was certainly true of, of Antonio Latore. He was and has been found guilty of racketeering, robbery, extortion, and accused of running a, a, a clan in, in Naples that is involved in murder, drug dealing, and arms trafficking. But he's described in newspapers as a devoted family man. So what I wonder was that were the contradictions that the Scottish uh, Mrs. Latore was, feel, was feeling. Was she really the innocent who was raising her three children, helping out in the family restaurant, while not wondering about her notorious father-in-law, who was all over the papers back in Italy, her brother-in-law in prison for 40 murders, um, or her husband's rapidly growing uh, fortune from a couple of Aberdeen restaurants? Or was it more complicated than that? Was she, was she dealing with internal conflict? Was she trying to work out what her role was in the family? And we'll never know because she has, she's never talked to about this. I know I would have been wondering exactly what was happening and I would have been struggling with it. But maybe that's what led to their divorce after 25 years. She's, she's not talked about it. She has absolutely maintained her faith in her husband's innocence. And what I think is equally interesting is that the media has allowed her to do exactly the same. They haven't asked what the Scottish woman's role was in, in one of the um, Italy's most famous crime groups. They've bought the same stereotype of the mafia wife docile and tainted by, by their husband's notorious and nefarious um, activities. I am going to be publicly more open about the contradictions that, that I struggle with um, and I'm going to hopefully show that contradiction isn't a bad thing, that we can, we can embody them. Some are good, 
that women that have contradictions are not difficult, that we're human, we're fascinating, and we probably make the world a more interesting place. We certainly make it like a beautiful mess, and that's a good thing as this, uh, as this quote shows. So I'm going to talk about three different contradictions that I struggle with on a daily basis. Um, and I really do struggle with them. And I'm going to give you some examples of how I've tried to sort of reconcile and, and deal with them. Um, and the three different contradictions are quiet versus loud. This sort of internalised belief that I should be quiet, that I should be like waiting my turn when actually I've got this hugely strong desire to stand on the table and shout, it's my turn, I want to have a chance. The second contradiction, again, Lindley sort of like touched on this as well, other ver others versus me. This huge desire to please others when actually I should maybe just be concentrating and I want to just please myself. And then the third one is active versus passive. This sort of drive that I should be constantly doing something when really all I want to do is lie down. So let's start with the contradiction, one of the probably most famous ones. Uh, you can boo at this point, you really can boo. Um, I don't, know, I don't know what's worse, British or American politics at the moment. Um, but this contradiction that we really, really just should be quiet and we should wait our turn when, in fact, you know, we want to push our way to the front of the queue and be like Diana or Diana Ross. We really want to do that. And I think that just to go back to, to, uh, uh, to Donald Trump, um, like politics is probably where I've felt this um, most acutely and, and most recently. So, um, as Professor Campbell said, like I, I was a, I am, I'm a huge Remain supporter. Um, I've lived all over Europe. Um, I really believe that we're stronger than when we work together. Um, I felt that many, though not all, of the Leave campaign were motivated by a mixture of racism and nationalism. Um, and that those that weren't voting Leave for those reasons, and there are some, were still allowing the validation of that level of xenophobia that was used by the campaign. And I, I still think that. And whilst that fear of others um, may be understandable, and we can talk about that afterwards, it wasn't a world that I wanted to live in, um, and it wasn't one that I just wanted to stand by and watch. And I also saw that it contributed in the weeks before the Brexit um, vote to the murder of, of the Labour MP and feminist campaigner um, Joe Cox. And I knew that I wanted more people like Joe Cox in Parliament. I wanted more people like me in Parliament. And I thought, right, there's going to be a really long queue. It's going to be like this. There's going to be women for decades have been waiting to get in. There's that long queue. And I looked around and I looked really hard. And do you know what? There wasn't a queue. There wasn't a long queue of women waiting to fight for the job. So if I wasn't going to step up, who was? There was nothing to stop me. I had to do it. So in the morning of the 24th of, of June 2016, and I can still vividly remember um, the experience, in this haze, haze of sort of disbelief that, and I'm sure many of you can, can still remember it, that, that this vote had happened, I decided I needed to do more than just protest. I had to take part. I wanted to be part in an optimistic movement that was really going to make a difference. So I made the insane decision to put myself forward uh, to be a Member of Parliament as a pro-Remain, pro-equality, pro-tolerant, and you can boo again at this point, Liberal Democrat. Um, and I was going... <laughs> um, I'm a really nice person and there's lots of reasons. <laughs> uh, but I was, going to be, I was going to be really loud. And it was a really insane decision because I'd never done anything like this before. I had no political campaigning experience. I was working for Facebook at the time, as I am now, like it was a massive job. I had two small young children and I had a partner. Uh, and it really was the most frightening decision I'd ever made. This is my launch speech, so you can sort of probably see how, like, how terrified it was. There was like a larger crowd in front of me. I wasn't just by myself. Um, and it's the only thing that sort of like that, that talked off that sort of like fear of being a candidate was really that I had to actually run a campaign. Um, and if you're a lived you don't have like loads of resources, so I had to do, do it all, and it started yesterday. It was absolutely petrifying. But what it did mean is that I could now do something. I could go out, I could tell people what I thought. I could publicly campaign for a fairer, more tolerant, more open society. And I wasn't elected in 2017, but if I am, I can make sure that that's what the British people get. I could be loud, and I could be loud in the constituency um, where I'd lived for, for 20 years in Dulwich and West Norwood, which, interesting fact, 
was, as it was held for a long, long time by Aberdeen University alumni, Tessa Jill. Um, but just because that I'd given myself that permission to be out there, um, didn't mean I didn't struggle. I'm a natural extrovert, but I really, really did struggle um, to give myself permission to be loud. Um, because for such a long time, society had schooled me, just like it schools you, only to talk when I've got an opinion, when it's backed by facts and research, and only when I felt I really could add something. Um, I could certainly talk with authority on organised crime and on policing. By that point, I could talk about technology. Um, I talked to 10,000 people, and two people asked me um, about things that I really knew about. One person asked me about policing, and one person asked me about technology. The rest of the time, I was asked about the NHS, I was asked about education, I was asked about Brexit. And my strong, strong feeling was to question my own right to be able to have an opinion on this. Because on health, I'm not you, Professor Campbell. I haven't built up my, like a career leading in this area. On education, I'm not you, Professor Lord. I haven't, I haven't spent a lifetime building this world leading career. So why should someone listen to me on the basis that I was an infrequent user of the NHS, very infrequent user, that I'd been to school and I had children in school? Seriously, like what I had to learn to do was just to bullshit and be happy with it. But do you know what? That's not true. I had to learn that I could study policy papers, I could think about my own experience, and I could develop answers to questions that drew on those. And I had to learn that that wasn't bullshitting, it was actually doing my job, and it was preparing for, for political discussions, or doing Hillary Clinton. So, in terms of, I, I obviously spent some time like, trying to find the right pictures for, for today, and I googled Hillary Clinton and meme and like really sadly just sort of pointing to the, the amount of criticism that women get, it took me probably stroll, scrolling through 500 to find one that was neutral, let alone positive. Um, you know, I'm not unusual in terms of like being uncomfortable that having grabbed that space um, and that opportunity that I just want to retreat, that I want to be that like frightened cat. Because we all know that women speak less in work meetings and certainly get listened to less. Uh, but I didn't realise just how uncomfortable we were taking up public space, even when it's minimum risk. I was at a conference recently where I heard, I, it was um, in the US and talking about US research, that in public meetings in the US, so sort of community get togethers, men speak 85% of the time, even when clearly the whole community is there, except for school boards where women feel that they can contribute. So even though, that we, even though we know that we vote more, even though we know that we contribute more to community, we still feel we have to be quiet in public and that we can't own that space. And I remember looking at my daughter after she was born and looking at her and saying, hello, Kitty. And that was the name, like, think about what you name your daughter before you, like, not thought about the hello, Kitty bit. But I had this, like, like saying to her, like, hello, Kitty, and, and really strongly feeling, I did not want her to feel that she had to be quiet, that she had to wait her turn. That was my promise to her. And then at the same time, I, I had a four-year-old son, and I remember thinking there was something that I didn't, that I wanted for him. I wanted him to feel he had some responsibility for the well-being of those around him, and that he shouldn't leave that to the women and girls that he was friends with and that supported him. And I think that, tell, that brings me to my like, second contradiction, and one that I struggle with again daily, and maybe one that's also familiar to, to lots of you. That feeling that, should I be pleasing myself or should I be pleasing other people? And I think that men are generally brought up to please each other and women are brought up to please themselves. And that can't be right. There must be a way to strike that balance. And for me, this tension about pleasing others versus pleasing myself is more apparent in the workplace. Um, and maybe that's unusual. I don't really struggle with it at home. Um, 
I'm, I'm, maybe I should be better at serving my, my kids' um, needs, but actually I think we're, we're all in our family, we're pretty good ne negotiators and we bumble along and we manage to get what we need. And I did check that with my children, that they felt the same and, uh, and they did agree. They agree. But where I, and maybe you're different, but where I really struggle with this, with this pleasing other people versus pleasing myself, um, is in the workplace. And in particular, when it comes to like achieving like a long term vision versus like other ter other people's short term needs. And by their short term needs, I mean, I'm always prioritizing other people by responding to urgent emails, by helping other people with their presentations, by making sure colleagues understand the issues and they're ready for meetings, that they've got coffees in the thing in, in, in a meeting that they're attending. And I let my husband read this speech before, before I came. He said, really, you worry about whether people have got coffees and meetings? I was like, yeah, I really want everyone to be happy. And it just, I think, shows you that sort of like difference from how we're approaching life. I find it really difficult when my boss isn't happy. Um, and instead, I should be, instead of like this, and maybe this might sound familiar to, to lots of you, but instead of focusing on all of this, I should really be focusing on what I need and focusing on that longer term need. And for me, it's not about what I need right now. It is really about what is, the, what is my longer term vision? Because I know that part of what I really need is to not focus on like what's happening on Friday, but really looking at the longer term future. I know that I left law enforcement because I wanted to focus on, the, on what I saw as the bigger issues of how does, um, how does the digital online world uh, impact on people's safety, security and privacy. I knew I wanted to be able to struggle with that and I wasn't going to be able to contend with those sorts of, of problems um, running organised crime investigations at the same time. So I know I've got to prioritise those, um, that, that sort of like longer term need rather than people's sort of short term needs. So why am I doing that? Um, and honestly I don't know but I do know I'm on a continuous mission to get better at this. And I also know that the times that I have prioritised that, prioritised what I need over others, are the times that it's felt really good. And to be like super Californian about it, those are the times that it's fed like my inner, like my inner soul, it's what my inner essence is, what's really made me feel better. You know, and there's a great quote in Alice in Wonderland that you have to like own your own life, you've got to own your own future. And I know that the times that I refused to disband a, a cybercrime team because my boss told me that cybercrime was a fad, um, that that felt good. I know that when I took, didn't take a promotion for, uh, to move into drugs investigations because I felt that human trafficking was more important, that felt good. And I know that when I prioritised my academic research um, rather than day-to-day -day investigations because I knew it'd have a longer-term impact. That felt good. And I know that prioritising running for Parliament over my real career felt good. So I've really, really got to do that. So for me, it's like that, that contradiction of pleasing others versus pleasing myself is not just uh, a nice to do, it's really vital. Because if I'm not going to take time to prioritise what makes me happy, I'm not going to prefer. I'm not going to prioritise my own mission. And for me, mission is really important. This idea that I can have a role in creating a fairer, more tolerant, more open society on and offline. But I also know that actually, and I love. I love this quote, and I love the Cheshire Cat. That like plodding along. So Jill Tweedy wrote this in 1971. She was a Guardian columnist as well that there's no injustice that we're actually going to get make better if we're just sort of plodding along, smiling and smiling. Smiling and smiling is not going to get me anywhere at all. I've really got to like, it's going to be better for everyone if I'm prioritising what I need. Um, it's also going to make me a happier person to be around. So let's move on to, like, to my final contradiction, and that's active versus passive. Uh, and I have this a lot. So it's, when, I, when I think I'm just going to have to be active when all I want to do is, is lie down. Um, I feel like I've constantly got to be doing something. As we see on Facebook, or I see at Facebook, we've got to be having impact and nothing makes me happier than a long, well-organised to-do list. I love all the apps, Todoist, Google Keep, iPhone reminders. Except they also make me pretty miserable. <laughs> I, they're... they're Hours, days when I don't want to be reminded of everything that I've got to do, all of those small steps I've got to do to achieve my own goals. I do not want to be reminded of what I need to do to achieve my own goals. 
And I don't think that we are alone, uh, or I'm alone in that contradiction. Um, I suspect that many of you today, when you were asked, how are you, answered, oh, I'm really busy. Um, it's seen as a badge of honour. Interestingly, when I googled um, like stressed women for this slide, I saw all these pictures. I don't know how many of you look as glamorous as this when you're looking <laughs> stressed, but it's certainly like, yeah, the effects of stress. I feel very stressed. Um, I, look, I look a whole load worse. Um, you know, it's, it's seen as a badge of honour. Like, what, how much are you going to do today? Watch out, world. Really, I'm going to have a huge amount of impact. When actually, how many of you just wish that you were in a cafe with a good book and a coffee? And, or maybe that you just could go back to bed. Um, but if you do that, you'd feel really guilty, wouldn't you? You'd feel lazy and, and, and self-indulgent. And it's, so what do we do? We power through, we deal with the conflict. He said, I found a way through this uh, to do and not feel guilty. Um, to show that actually this contradiction is, is really useful. And I call it sort of self-preservation, or even better, nobody had their best idea at their desk. And basically it's that. Recognise that you've never had your best idea at your desk. I bet you had it going for a run, falling asleep, reading a book on the beach, or uh, like Archimedes, shouting Eureka in the bath. And this is like, I, I, this just makes me laugh. I was looking for bath pictures as well. This is my favourite. I laugh for hours over this. Like, this is what women are like in the bath, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like... <laughs> but this is also a great one because everyone has a latte and a glass of wine at the same time. <laughs> Regularly do that. <laughs> Love the little petal on the shoulder as well. Um, so I think that, that really, like, you, like let's embrace, let's, let's embrace it. Let's recognise that we can't fully function unless we've given ourselves time off to, uh, to relax, to let our brain make those, um, those connections that we're not going to be able to, to perform if, we, if we're frazzled. It's okay to rest, that we're going to be more active in, in, the, in the long term. And I think they are, just to, to calm you down, um, I think it's also good to recognise that there are particular times in life where it's really important to recognise that you do need more to be more passive rather than more active. There are times when that is more acute, and that's fine. So it could be you know, during your exams. Sorry to remind you all. Um, it could be like when you're changing a job. It could be when you're moving house or you're, or you're starting or ending a relationship. A relationship. And at Facebook, we've got our, um, our own version of, of Facebook. It's called Workplace. It's just like Facebook, but it, so it's got a news, po news feed, it's got a chat function, um, it's got groups. And a year ago, when I moved from the, US, from the UK to the US, um, I, I, I felt that need to just to rest, to be kind to myself, particularly acutely. And I also knew I was talking to a lot of people that had just started at Facebook. Um, I'd been there for, for almost five years and that I wanted other people to recognise this. So I wrote, I wrote a post um, that was emphasising as much as, uh, for myself as for others the importance of being kind. And this is what I wrote. Be kind to yourself. There's a huge amount to take in in any new job, from the size of some of our offices to the unique culture. There's a lot of information on any tech-related subject you're interested in, the relentless media focus, the IT, the hundreds of groups, calls, documents. Altogether, this is likely to make you very tired especially if you're doing it in a second or third language. Don't imagine that you'll be able to or need to take in everything in a few weeks. Let it all soak in. Take time. Ask your colleagues about things that don't make sense to you. Be kind to yourself. I've also seen the active versus passive contradiction um, in politics. So when I stood for a parliament in 2017, as you know, it's because Brexit really, really mattered to me. But something I also felt really strongly about uh, at the time, and, and I've repeatedly told um, people on my political um, teams, is that politics is a game of, of ebb and flow. Sometimes you want and you need to do a lot. Sometimes you want to, to just watch. Sometimes you don't even want to do that. Um, and that doesn't mean that the contradiction of being active and passive um, doesn't exist. I've heard it all the time from activists, people that have been run off their feet campaigning, who feel guilty for taking a break, or new members who've just started to engage and who apologise for the fact that this is the first time that they've started to do something. You should never apologise. There's a time to rest, there's a time to run for office, there's a time to vote, a time to canvass, a time to donate, and a time to switch off. 
and especially now when the world feels like it's in turmoil. And that's what I feel like. Um, but that doesn't mean actually that I do. Like, it's something that I really struggle with at the moment is how much I should be doing in British and, and US um, politics. It's a real, like, it's an act of struggle. But I think what I try to do is remind myself that, that being passive, so stopping and taking a break, is actually going to help me be more, um, be more active in the long run. So to conclude, um, I'm definitely a work in progress, like all of us. I keep, work, I keep living with the beautiful contradictions, the contradictions of whether I should be loud or quiet. Should I wait my turn or should I stand on that table and shout? Others versus myself. Should I please others or should I actually be focusing on what I need to do? An active versus passive. Should I be active or should I be lying down? And it's, I'm also going to stay frustrated. I'm not going to continually point to men like Boris Johnson, who, when they embrace their contradictions, get called colourful, wonderful. Or women who, like Nicola Sturgeon, are harangued for them and called not feminine enough. But more than anything, though, I'm going to continue to remember a quote that we've got up on our kitchen wall and one that we talk about every day, that your contradictions are beautiful. Because as Dr. Zeus said, today you are youer than you. That is truer than true and no one is alive who is youer than you. And being youer than you is the only way that we can challenge our own and others' perceptions and to continue to create the opportunities that all of us deserve. Thank you. Superb. I just love that. I think we're all sort of so, I mean, certainly I personally echoed with all these sort of complex, uh, you know, fights and wars that go in. Um, but I'm sure there are questions um, specifically for you at this point in time and then for the panel discussion. So can I open it up? Can I ask you one yeah. thing? Well, I've seen another question, but um, I think a lot of us go through with this sort of hinting and hoping behaviour. So we, we sort of hope things will happen without us taking action. But you obviously, you know, when you decided to stand for Parliament, you moved from that sort of hinting and hoping behaviour to actual action. And so do you have any tips, you know, for us, you know, if we feel that we're actually on that cusp of wanting to move from that slightly more passive, hoping it'll happen to actual action? I think it's like don't catastrophize. Be able to speak properly. Catastrophize. I think it's um, like often like we're very good, and I think women do this more than men. We think of like oh, like disaster will happen if I do it, or there's always someone more qualified than me. And often there are there will someone that will tell you absolutely there's somebody more qualified than you. When in fact I think it's thinking what's the worst thing that can happen, and. One thing I also think about a lot is um, is that free is the you know the, the what are you going to think on your deathbed? Like, what do you want to be remembered for? And most people, I think, when they're all the research shows, and again, it was Australian research that um, that what people regret is what they didn't do, not what they did do. So, what's the worst thing that's going to happen if you do do it? Um, like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to lose. Like, I lost. You know, it, it was an incredible experience and a huge privilege. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? Um, and then go for it. Perfect advice. So, so uh, talk at the back. Question. Hi, thanks. Um, I'd just like to thank yourself and uh, Dr. Lord for two excellent addresses. Um, you mentioned uh, contradictions in your, in your address, and I was just wondering what you think about the contradiction with this excellent event um, being sponsored by TACA, which is a state-owned company of the United Arab Emirates, which, as we know, has a, a terrible track record on women's rights, like their um, Article 56, which, in their law, which makes it obligatory for women to obey their husbands. I was just wondering what you thought about that contradiction, and maybe the vice principal would also like to answer that question. Thanks. Do I, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, I work for Facebook, so there's, I think that big companies like individuals inevitably have a number of different issues that they have to deal with at any, at any one time. I, do, I mean, I, I don't know about TACA, so I can't really comment on that, but I do know that, that a lot of things are much more complicated than, and more nuanced like individuals. But I don't know if you want to. I, th I think I would just, um, 
uh, echo that and actually um, actions here are speaking very loud in that there is direct and clear sponsorship um, here today supporting women so I think um, at a face value that's what we need to take forward here in Aberdeen is that there's actual action supporting uh, women and women's uh, promotion so I think that is worthwhile echoing around here. Other questions before coffee? Oh, there's one upstairs. Okay, um, look up. I think there's a roving mic. Hello. Um, to take you back to your campaign for running for Parliament, we heard a lot about you starting off and how that felt and what your expectations were or your mm. hopes. How did it feel at the end? And was there anything surprising about it that you learned about gender equality? Um, that's, that's a great great question um, I learned a huge amount through it it's probably one of those sort of like very intense experiences but where you learn a huge amount I think that the um, if I sort of talk about like two things that I learned one is that for most people the the thing that really matters to them is what's on their doorstep like issues that they're dealing with right now um, so that could be like it, when I talked to I was asked about the NHS I wasn't asked about the NHS generally I was asked about what's happening with my doctor surgery what's happening with my um, with the with the hospital that might be closing down the road so it's very like immediate things and that's what most people like concentrate on they're not really interested in having a huge theoretical debate around around Brexit um, I also learned that it really like nobody if, you, if you're a high profile politician people are interested in you as an individual They're, if you are running in a constituency um, if you're not high profile they really like I was just a yellow person just as there was a red person and a blue person um, there wasn't a lot of interest in me as a person so I think I think that was sort of like how people's everyday take was one of the things that I took away from it um, the second thing was around a was around not just how I was treated as a woman, but how um, how I was treated as a as an opposition candidate, and that was possibly the most difficult thing to deal with, the attacks. And it wasn't. I mean, it was. It was. They were really sort of. They were just annoying, to be honest. And it, I mean, I had. Um, I did a lot on, unsurprisingly, on social media, and I'd see out of um, every hundred comments, and I was getting like maybe a hundred comments um, every hour. I'd have two that were actively engaging in a positive way one that was um that was engaging and to criticize me but still engaging one that was um that was a death threat or or some sort of like uh, just like really vile attack um and then a lot that were just inane criticism and it would usually say and i so i was labor facing a, a huge amount of criticism for momentum and it was always just um something some expletive vote corbin and just like hundreds of those um and that was that was pretty difficult to deal with and i think that um I did experience more of that, and I've talked to other women candidates from across the political parties that, that more of that does seem to be targeted at women rather than, than at men. Yeah. Okay, um, it is night time for coffee, um, so um, we have 20 minutes to go out and mingle and um, sort of really mull over these points that have been raised, um, but I just want to close this session by thanking our first two speakers for just amazing, inspirational, thoughtful. Uh, I've got so many things buzzing around in my head that I want to chat about. Um, so continue the conversation and we'll have you back in, in 20 minutes. But a uh, round of applause for you. Okay, um, I think just about everybody's taking their seats again. Just a couple of minutes. Are we ready for more? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just fantastic presentations this morning, um, and we've got plenty more to come. Um, so um, in, in this session, we're going to have one of the speakers, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. I'm really looking forward to that. So um, if you want to jot down questions for the panel discussion, um, just think about that and have them ready for when we have everybody up on stage. But um, 
Now it's time um, for our third uh, speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Linda Papadopoulos. Um, and uh, Linda is one of the most recognisable and well-respected psychologists working in the UK today. You will probably all have seen her on TV at one point in time. So Linda has built an outstanding reputation in both academia and broadcasting. Hugely successful psychologist, author, keynote speaker, columnist, host, broadcaster. So Linda's analysis on current affairs, uh, trends and human behaviour is highly sought after and syndicated around the world. So with an array of credits in broadcast, radio and print media, uh, Linda has fronted shows for channels and networks including the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, TLC, as well as presenting features for ITV's This Morning, Good Morning Britain, BBC's The One Show, the list goes on, she's been everywhere. Um, so Linda promotes a philosophy that promotes and encourages people to develop healthy self-esteem and body image. Um, she was recently awarded the prestigious EVCOM, I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, or Evcon, and she'll tell us herself, Fellowship Award in recognition of her outstanding and prolific academic publication record are for being an exceptional communicator, which I'm sure we'll hear shortly, both as an author and as a broadcaster. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much. It is, it is brilliant to be here. Um, uh, I, I think this is such a special day. It's a special day because I think it does two things. It talks about how far we've come, but it also gives us a moment to pause and think about how far we have to go. Um, I've, I've loved the talk so far. I could listen to, to Professor Lindley and, and, Grant, and um, Gail to, like, speak the whole time. And I, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to kind of um, cover what they've said as well. I want to speak about confidence today. The reason that I want to speak about confidence is as a psychologist, um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that there's no power without responsibility. And I think if we want to see change as women, we need to absolutely make sure that change happens systemically. But what I want to focus on today is what we can do internally, how we can think about the way we speak to ourselves, the way we think about situations that we find ourselves in, and how that can then impact on how far we go. So, as we've seen so far, we have made undeniable progress, right? So in the US and the UK, we now earn more college and graduate degrees than do men. We make up half the workforce, pretty cool. We're closing the gap in middle management. Um, the majority, interestingly, of business startups belong to women, and failure rates are actually less for those that start up with women rather than men. And studies uh, you know, by, by huge corporations like Goldman's and uh, universities like Columbia have found that companies employing women in larger numbers outperform competitors on every measure of profitability. Pretty cool. However, the stats are very well known, right? At the top, women are still scarce. Numbers are increasing, not as fast as we've liked. But was it 250 years? Um, of the 2,000 of the world's top performing companies, only around 1.5% of CEOs are women. Um, likewise, in the Fortune 500, that's closer to two and a half. Um, even though we uh, comprise 57% of all college students, only 26% of full-time professors um, are female, and that's about 14% for, for uh, university presidents. Likewise, we see these problems in the media and in television, um, and even in professions like law, which again, you tend to see more women. So why? What's going on? And we know, we know what the big things tend to be, right? So a lot of observers say it's kids, that they change parties. We still haven't cracked that one, yeah? We haven't done it effectively yet. I think part of that, can I just say as well, is because we not only need to make space for women kind of being able to enter the workforce, we need to make space for men that want to stay home and take care of the kids until we stop stigmatizing that. This is not going to change, and I think this is why we need to look at these things from both directions. Um, inflexible workplaces, we know that that's an issue in terms of timing and child rearing as well. Again, the great work that's going on around sexist and cultural norms, outright discrimination. Professor Lindley touched on, we see a hell of a lot of that. Um, but what I want to focus on today is something that is quite basic, which is, in fact, confidence. 
All right. So in 2011, uh, the Institute of Leadership and Management surveyed British managers about how confident they felt in their professions. Half the female respondents reported self-doubt about their job performance compared to less than a third of male respondents. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we ask for things differently, right? So we know that men instigate salary negotiations more often than do women. And when they do, they tend to ask for around, women tend to ask for about 30% less money than do men. Um, Again, a very famous study that came out of um, Professor uh, Davidson does this often at Manchester Business School. She'll do this almost every year, ask her students how much they expect to deserve. And on average, women tend to report feeling that they'll deserve 20% less. Another one of my um, favorites that sort of sticks out for me, when they ask men and women to give a metaphor for salary negotiations, men say things like, well, it's like going in and to play a game of baseball. And women say, well, it's like going to a dentist's appointment. <laughs> So this idea of how we see things, how we approach them, is key. Um, this is an interesting one. This always sort of um, always resonates with me so much. So Hewlett Packard, a few years ago, you know, really realized that diversity is important because we know that companies that employ a diverse workforce, they do better on all measures of profitability. And they were like, great, so we're getting girls in, so we're recruiting them kind of in the lower strata. In middle management, we have them there, we're kind of getting them up. But what's going on? We're trying to recruit in the higher echelons. We can't get women to, you know, they, they, you know we're not getting the numbers that we want. So they kind of, they pulled... Um, uh, the, the records of, um, from HR to see what was going on, and they found that they were putting the jobs out there, but they found that for women to apply, they felt they had to have 100% of everything that the job specification asked for. So when it said, you know, speak French, you know, a woman would say, well, you know, and I was just speaking to some of the lovely students before, I did see, you know, French at high school, and, you know, I remember it quite well, but actually, oh, God, it's not that great. A guy could be like, well, you know, I went on holiday to Paris last week, you know, kind of okay with, like, asking. So, so we find that men would apply when they, when they were able to have about 60% of what was needed. For women, they needed 100%. And the key here is that this confidence for men worked out. Because we're not talking about bluster here. We're not talking about, I'm going to pretend. What guys were doing was saying, look, I'm not great at French, but actually, I feel I have it in me to, to learn, to surround myself with people that know. So do you know what? It won't be an issue. And you know what? It usually isn't. Whereas for girls, for women, it's this idea that if I'm not perfect, if I don't have that, you know, that level that I think I need to, then I'm going to be judged. I won't do it, so I'm not going to try. So why do we think this is going on? Well, maybe there's this notion that you can't be what you can't see. And some researchers have pointed to this um, study that came, I think, um, I think this was out of... Um, of Berkeley a few years ago, um, they asked uh, 150 students to make uh, a public speech about school fees. And they gave them three conditions. In the first condition, there was a poster of a powerful woman, either Hillary Clinton or Angela Merkel in the back. In the second condition, there was a poster of Bill Clinton. And in the third condition, there was no poster. Uh, what we found, or what they found rather, was that students spoke significantly longer when there was a powerful woman in the back. This was true of female students. It had no effect on male students. Um, in fact, they, it, there was an increase of 49% making their speech longer, and this was believed to be a sign of dominance. So there's a sense that if you kind of are reminded that there's people of power that look like you out there, if you're reminded that there's competent, confident people that look like you out there, then maybe that makes it easier. Um, I do a lot of work on this sexualization and objectification of women. And, you know, again, you know, the, the images that we have of girls, you know, selling products, you know, their bodies being dismembered, you know, being diminished down to the right pair of legs, the, you know, the great pair of eyelashes or lips, this idea that your value lies in the way that you look is hugely detrimental. Uh, you know, again, one of those other killer quotes is that the, you know, the only three places that women outperform men financially are prostitution, modeling, and the sex industry. 
You know, this kind of speaks to the fact of how do we commodify the female body instead of valuing the female mind, the brain, what we have to give back. So this idea of showing our daughters, of reminding ourselves, you know, of looking and listening to and, you know, building each other up and exposing each other for what we have to give is key because I do think there's something about being what you can see. Because self-perception is key. Again, um, Brenda Major, social psychologist out of California, says one of the most consistent findings that she has is when she asks women and men you know, to, to estimate their ability to perform a task. And she does this on different kinds of tasks. And consistently, she says, you will find that men overestimate, women underestimate their ability. Now, am I saying that men never doubt themselves? Of course they do but they don't let their doubts stop them. They don't let their doubts stop them. I think this is key because what we're seeing, and Ernesto Rubin does a lot on this out of Colombia, what we're seeing is what he calls honest overconfidence, right? So they're saying, look, I feel a little bit anxious about giving this talk, but I think, you know, I think it'll be okay because I'm gonna remind myself that I've prepared, I've done my stuff, or I feel a little bit anxious about kind of applying for this job, but I know that if I work hard at it, I might be able to do it. And so there's something about this idea of, of turning belief into action. We know from a, a, a sort of a body language, psychological perspective, when people are confident, regardless of capability, they, they actually display a lot of this confident, nonverbal behavior that we are sort of programmed to respond to. So they have sort of expansive body language. Um, they have a lower vocal tone. They tend to speak early in groups, um, in a calm, in a relaxed manner. So they, you know, and a lot of this stuff is kind of, it's evolutionarily and socially, it's something that we respond to, right? This kind of idea of what people are imbuing. Um, so again, the reason that confident people don't alienate others is that they aren't faking it. They believe they're good. And people don't tend to kind of, you know, see the tells that someone who's pretending often has. Um, okay. Now the problem is what? Confidence informs a number of familiar female habits. And we've heard about some of these today, right? The, the idea of kind of apologizing constantly, the idea of feeling uncomfortable with taking credit and saying, oh, well, it wasn't me, it was like it was everybody, and you know, and actually I was just really lucky um, allowing others to interrupt. Perfectionism. Perfectionism is another huge confidence killer. As a mother of a daughter, as someone who studies the psychology of women, um, I can tell you, I think it is one of the most insidious things, this idea that good enough is not good enough. Because the only thing that perfectionism ever gets you is the feeling that you'll never be able to make that step. You're never ready. You can always do more. And I think this is something that we need to begin to push back on as educators, as parents. I think generally a discussion around what perfect is is hugely unhelpful. And I, frankly, I don't think social media has helped in some ways with regards to, you know, again, I do a lot of work on body image. And if I wanted to create a, a cognitive exercise and poor self-esteem, I'd, I'd get you all to take a bunch of pictures of yourself and I'd get you to kind of scroll, find the one that you feel, you, you know, you look the least bad in, then I'd, I'd get you to spend some time editing that picture, getting the right filter on, getting the right light, then I'd get you to post it and I'd get you to sit back and wait. If you don't get 50 likes, take it down and start over again. And this is something that we have kids starting from ages of 11 to 12 doing in and out every day. Well, what does that do to your confidence? We'll see in a second what it does to the confidence of teens and queens. Um, confidence also impacts attribution, right? So what we attribute things to. Famously, there's a, a course in Cornell and the PhD program, it's a math course. It gets really, really difficult halfway through the semester. And when um, men and women are asked to respond to how they feel about it, kind of guys will say, wow, you know, this is a, a tough class. And girls will say things like, well, I, you know, I wasn't that good at it. So the way, again, that we explain difficulties, failures, successes, 
feeds into how we feel about ourselves, feeds into our own confidence and confidence, what psychologists call, lo call locus of control, right? This idea, am I internalizing this? Do I feel that you know, by internalizing this, will this bring me forward? Or am I feeling that this, you know, this is something that's out of my control, I'm just not good at it, there's nothing I can do? Now, just to very briefly kind of look at some of the reasons why we may see these differences in males and females. There is an argument in, um, around the fact that women experience anxiety and stress differently than do men, right? So there is a biological explanation. Um, there is a part of the, the old part of the brain, the reptilian brain, the amygdala, and that's where we store emotional memory, right? And we know that women tend to activate their amygdala more easily in response to negative stimuli than do men. So that means that not only do we kind of feel it more quickly, but we tend to ruminate on it more. We are able to access that more quickly. Um, and because of that, we tend to kind of feel it harder to kind of let go of a situation. We tend to be more anxious around things. So, I mean, obviously, you know, nurture matters as well, but this is something that a lot of theorists are looking into. In terms of nurture, um, uh, Carol Dweck has written extensively about this, um, and we know that girls and boys, interestingly enough, start school when girls are a lot more ready, right? They kind of, they're able to sit and listen more than boys, they're able to engage more. So you would think this is great because they do better at school. But here's what, what Dweck says is happening. Girls are told very early on, wow, you're doing great, and you're so quiet, and you're being such a good girl. You're such a good girl. Look at you being all quiet and pleasing me. Good girl. Just being, you just please me, and you be like, that's awesome. And boys are like, what the hell are you doing? Sit down. You're being naughty again. What's happening here? Girls are told, are learning that what is valued in me is to be the good girl, is to be the best, is to get the good grade. Boys are learning. They tell me to sit down and be quiet, and you know what, it's not the end of the world. And actually, I'm quite resilient, and things are okay. So what we're seeing is girls doing brilliantly at school and you know, getting these amazing grades and coming out with better marks than boys. But then, what happens? What happens in the boardrooms? What happens later on? Well, the goalposts move, and it no longer matters that you're the good girl. What matters is that you take risks, that you're resilient, that you can talk the talk, that you have the confidence. Um, Dweck has this um, fabulous uh, quote, she says, if life were one long grade school, women would be the undisputed rulers of the world. But <laughs> sadly, the goalposts shift considerably. We need people that take risks, that take risks and rebound, and don't see failure as an internal flaw that they can't bounce back from, but see failure as a normal part of success. So when do we see this shift? Well, we tend to see this shift around puberty, right? Teens and tweens. Um, so kind of to start off with, girls and boys kind of quite equally confident, right? When we ask them, we look at what they engage in. Um, the U-Pulse, this is a, quite a, a big U-Pulse study that happened uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we tend to see this starting to shift um, between the ages, it starts slightly at age, around eight, but we see it more towards 12 to 13. In fact, the proportion of girls who say they are not allowed to fail rises from 18 to 45 percent, the ages of 12 and 13, that they are not allowed to fail, right? So until the age, very little difference in confidence, but by the age of 14, the average girl, far less confident. Um, and the thing is, with confidence, it's self-perpetuating, right? It multiplies itself. So as we take risks, we see payoffs, and then we gain the courage to take more risks, and then we see those payoffs, and it kind of, it's a cumulative thing. It, it's something that, that, you know, that we have to sort of bounce back from. Now, this is troubling, because if what we're seeing is that this is not being built up, this is not being stockpiled, you know, with our girls, then actually later on in life, in adulthood, this becomes an issue. Um, and again, not to, to you know, berate the point too much, but this self-awareness that young people have now because of this constant exposure of, of the self, right? If you think about, you know, and, and there's a lot of wonderful sides to social media. I'm a huge fan in a lot of ways. But I think one of the downside is this constant amplified self-awareness. So I have an idea and I put it up 
And whereas before, this idea, you know, I'd, I'd have someone who knew me who'd come back and say, well, hey, Linda, are you sure about that? You know, or like, I think this. Now, you just get hate, or you get people not liking, or you get people telling you what they think about you. So it's almost like having this sort of global focus group commenting on your every move and shaping you. And this is new, right? When we were establishing our identities, when we were establishing our confidence, we didn't have this before. We have it now. Um, obviously, expectations matter, right? So again, the way that, um, that we understand and kind of take on criticism, how we absorb that is really important. And one of the things that we, again, see um, from a lot of the research is that girls learn to avoid taking risks um, because of, you know, it, it becomes something that's, that's an affront to their, their self, you know, their identity, their, their, their feelings of safety. Boys, meanwhile, tend to kind of absorb this a lot easier. So Dweck's research observed that um, grade school classrooms, that boys got eight times more criticism than girls for their conduct. Um, and boys' mistakes were often attributed to a lack of effort, which was interesting. So he's not doing well because he's not trying hard enough. While girls, they would begin to see their mistakes as something lacking, something deeper about them. So that's very interesting as well. So even when we make mistakes, which is fine, and we're scolded for them, there's a difference in that attribution of what does it mean. Now, one of the things that, um, that I often speak about that I think is key when it comes to resilience and confidence is sport. Um, I think for body image, it's amazing because it teaches you your body is not just something to look at, it's something functional, you know? Your legs are not just looking good in jeans, they're about running and jumping, you know? And there's something about that bonding and that, that team spirit and losing and being able to, to work within teams and, and follow and lead. Now, very sadly, we know that girls, even though they start off playing as much sports as boys, we know that falls off significantly. And the benefits are huge. We know that girls that graduate from college, uh, uh, in terms of people that play sports, girls that play sports, they tend to graduate from college more, be employed more in male-dominated universities, they earn higher salaries. Um, they actually, this was a great study I found recently, uh, it came out of um, ESPN, that 94% of the women currently employed with C-suite jobs, and by C-suite jobs, I mean CEO, CFO, CIO, had at some point played competitive sports, right? Because it's, it's an organized way to experience loss and failure and resilience. Um, despite this, like I said, fewer girls and boys participate in athletics, and many who do quit early. Um, part of this we believe has to do with kind of again body image issues. I don't want to get too muscular. Um, I you know I, I don't uh, I don't value it in the same way. Different things are valued around me in terms of my schoolwork, in terms of other things other than sport. So um, I think this is this is a kind of a really important one. Again, I always think of it as a parent or as educators. This idea of kind of ensuring that girls and you know what. There is some research to attest to the fact that as well as sport, anything that gets them out of their comfort zone, you know, you know, going on a, on a debate, being on a debate team, coming out and, and having to protest something, encouraging girls to come out of that comfort zone, to work in teams, to establish that resilience, it's key. So confidence is not just feeling good about yourself, right? If we needed a few words of encouragement, we would have been fine. There's a much more useful contribution, um, definition rather, that um, this came from Richard Petty out of Ohio State. He says, confidence is the stuff that turns thoughts into action. I love that. Confidence is the stuff that turns thoughts into action. Now, the simplicity here is compelling, right? Um, confidence is a belief, a belief in one's ability to succeed, and that then stimulates action. And in turn, taking action bolsters one's ability to succeed. And so it accumulates through this. It accumulates through hard work and through success. And we see this sort of virtuous cycle. Um, Estes um, et al. did a, a brilliant study to kind of look at this confidence in action thing. So um, he gave 500 students a series of tests and various sort of cognitive tests. And one was about um, turning 3D images in your mind and answering questions. So 
Interestingly, women scored worse than men, right? So when the results were examined, realized that women weren't doing as well as men, but he realized that the reason women weren't scoring as well as men is because they weren't answering every question. So he went back and said, okay, I'm gonna give you the test again. You have to answer every question. It's mandatory. This time, women's score improved to be just as good as the men's score. Now, this is interesting because it illustrates this key point, right? The natural result of low confidence is what? It's inaction. If I feel I can't, then I won't. If I feel I shouldn't, if I feel that I'm not good enough, I will feel safer staying away. You don't move in life. You don't progress unless you're doing something that is uncomfortable. The only, the only way we've ever kind of progressed is that taking that first step into the unknown. And so we need to make this feel more doable for young girls. He, um, he then asked, interestingly, students to, to do the same thing. And he said, but this time I want you to rate how well you think you did on the questions. Once he did that, he realized that scores fell again. Simply thinking about how unsure we are causes that backdrop. He then said arbitrarily to a group of women, men and women that they did well, another group that they didn't, and he found on the next score, uh, the next test that they took, the men and women improved their scores dramatically if they were told they'd done better. So it was clear that confidence can be self-perpetuating. Now, I can't say it as eloquently as Professor Lindley, but context obviously matters too, right? There's a, a huge amount of research I picked up on a couple of studies that have come out recently. Um, speaking to this idea, which again is fascinating. So we're saying to him, be confident, that's all it takes. But we're all saying, but be nice though. Be confident, but be kind and sweet and gentle because we want you to be like both, because, not too much of one or the other. And, and, and this is, a contradiction, right? It's like this is a contradiction. So we want you to come and ask for that pay rise, but we're not sure we want you to do it as aggressively. So, so what happens, right? What happens when women are told that unless they promote these pro-social behaviors, their confidence won't be accepted? I think absolutely we need to change the systems. I think absolutely we need to look at how these are being perpetuated. But it's not mutually exclusive. I think at the same time, what can we as women in these organizations do while we're waiting for all this to change? Well, I'll tell you what I think we should do overall. I think number one, as a whole, we need to be aware of perfectionism in girls and challenge it. I'm, um, I'm an only child, I have an only child, and I know as a girl and only child, perfectionism is rife. And I remember catching my daughter, she must have been two or three, scrumpling up a piece of a drawing that she'd done. And I said, Jesse, what are you doing? And she said to me, like, she had a list, but it's not perfect. And I were taking it up and putting it on the board and telling her perfect doesn't exist. And that has been my thing since she was little. Perfect doesn't exist. It's captured in a moment. It's captured in, in, you know, in a sunset or a dinner with a girlfriend or captured in a small piece of writing you do, but it's not somewhere that you get to and you never stop. That's not realistic. So we need to challenge that wherever we see it in terms of the way they're supposed to look, in terms of how they're supposed to behave, in terms of how many people are supposed to like them. Secondly, we need to normalize failure um, and talk about expectations informing actions. You know, anyone that's tried anything knows, knows that the only way you succeed is by approximating to success, and that means you know, making sure that when you fail, you learn from it and you move on. If you see failure as something to be avoided at all costs, you will avoid everything. Um, we need to talk about fixed and growth mindsets. I'm a huge fan of Carol Dark's work. Again, this idea that, um, that we all have the capacity to grow, right? If we believe that this is what I have, you know, I'm bad at math and I'll always be bad at math, I will never try. Likewise, if I believe, I'm brilliant and you know, I don't need to try, I will never try. Instead, we know the people that succeed, men and women, are those that have growth mindsets, that are open to new ideas, that are open to asking questions, that are okay with asking the stupid question possibly and getting it wrong because that's how we learn. In terms of workplaces, a simple tactic 
um, is to normalize the practice of self-promotion, to allow women to talk about their achievements um, without facing the backlash. So just imagine in a boardroom, if you knew every Monday we're gonna go around and I want everyone to say one achievement they've done today, male or female, mandatory across the board. So you have to do it. That in a way systemically means that we're all you know, encouraged to kind of promote this aspect of ourselves rather than hiding it. Um, Again, holding workshops and companies that highlight for employees this research on this backlash. I think understanding where these things come from is huge. I'm delighted to see that there's men here today because you know we need to work on this together. You know, women's issues, you know, women's rights, it's it's a human's right issue, and, and it's good for all of us. And all of us want to have better work environments, and we all want to get along in a way that's that's collaboratively better. So we need to ensure that we can do this. I think women need to think about their language, framing achievements, both as an individual but in communal terms, and making it clear that they were part of the work. So, you know, I led on this, and the, you know, and this was who was around me. Um, and I think finally, normalizing the kind of transparency in the workplace with policies and collective structural changes, like Professor Lindley spoke about, is key as well. So. The advice in all this research I've spoke about is, is not unfamiliar, right? To become more confident, women need to stop thinking so much and act. So almost daily we get this new evidence about you know, how much our brains can change you know, over time. And I'm a you know, huge believer in this. You know, psychologists, we say that we have this saying that neurons that fire together wire together, right? I always say to my clients that I see clinically, it's like we're doing brain surgery when we're doing therapy because we're changing the way your brain works. So think about it. Nobody speaks to you more than you speak to yourself. Beware of what you say. Curate your consciousness. Read the stuff that allows you to feel good about your abilities, to, that allows you to feel okay about the times you fail as well as the times you can succeed. Because there's something very powerful about how we speak to ourselves, what we look at, what we see. And I think if we keep at it, then we will no doubt move from faking it to making it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
can't see anybody, but uh, speak. Okay. Hi, my name's Nadia. Um, I've got an, a, a question regarding um, Amber Rudd. Um, she was supposed to be speaking at the Oxford University, and it was in the Guardian that it was cancelled. Her, um, she was actually um, the invitation was taken back that she wasn't to appear at the university, and it was done through probably dec uh, democratically. It was voted that she shouldn't um, come on for the women's um, international women's. Um, so my question is, do you think that we are very, you know, the contradiction is that we're being very heavy handed with Amber Rudd. She's a polit um, she was a minister and that she wasn't given the platform to be able to speak about the Windrush um, saga that's going on, which is very controversial. But personally, I feel that we are actually contradicting ourselves that we women are probably criticise ourselves more than probably men here and I feel quite sad the fact that that's happened what's your thoughts on that yeah I, I think that's a great question um I've got to say I am not a fan of deplatforming um I'm a I'm a huge believer that um university especially is a place you're supposed to be confronted with views that are not like your own, even if they're ridiculous views or uncomfortable views or, uh, you know, um, I think, again, as a psychologist, I have an issue with this idea that you protect someone by taking away what scares them. I think it does the exact opposite. If you came to me and you were afraid of something, you know, the last thing I would say to you is to avoid that at all cost. Instead, I would work with you to kind of look at how you could manage that fear, even if, if you were right to be afraid, how you could manage, that's what promotes resilience. Now, does it happen more for women than for men? Um, I, I, I think it does. I think, you know, and there's been some quite high profile cases, like, you know, Jermaine Greer, lover or, you know, or not, she's, she's done a hell of a lot for the cause and the idea that she's kind of seen as someone that hasn't helped feminism, again, absolutely, but let's just, let's debate this. Let's debate, is she, is she helping it now? Is what she's saying right or wrong? Fine, but the idea that I silence you as a means for protecting me, I think we've got that all wrong. We have another couple of questions up here. Okay. okay. Good morning. Mine is a uh, comment rather than a question, is that okay? Okay, uh, my name is Aisha Yesofu. I'm a member of the Bring Back Our Girls movement uh, that have been fighting for the rescue of the Chippewa girls who have been in captivity for 2,153 days today. Uh, what I want to talk about basically is labeling. And I think we do that a lot as women. We don't see ourselves as individuals, we see ourselves as women. So first of all, it's like, okay, I have to be that person that has to take responsibility for everything every other woman has done. When a man does something that it's wrong, it's his responsibility as that person. The next man doesn't take on what he has done. But as a woman, when somebody does something, that it means that all of us have to pay for it. And I think in a way, it's something that we need to stop doing. On my Twitter handle, I have it there where I say I don't do labor. Uh, and also the fact that I am me. My mom says in my cut, nobody wins, and you will either love me or hate me, and either one, it's okay. So whatever people feel about me, it's their own problem. It's not my responsibility, and I think we need to do that uh, as women. You know, earlier on, we, we spoke about the issue of Hillary Clinton. I remember during her campaign when Michelle Obama said, if they go low, you will go higher, right? But the thing is, I said, no, if they go low, we go lower deal with them, then you come up and shower. That's the way it is. Because we've been made to believe that as women, we are supposed to behave in a certain way. And that has held us back. We feel we need to conform. Enough of conforming. We've been doing that for centuries. It hasn't gotten us anywhere. I'm not in this world to conform to any person to what the society wants me to conform to. I want the society to conform to the person that I am. Thank you. That seems a very good point to get the whole panel up on uh, stage because I think we're going to move into general discussions now. Um, so if I could ask all the speakers to come up. 
I think we're going to get fresh glasses and water um, on stage. Um, so we'll just take a couple of minutes. As, oh, and they magically appear. Okay, we've got about um, 20 minutes or so, um, maybe not quite that, but um, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So um, we've got all the speakers uh, up on stage now, so um, we can sort of dot three mics on and off as, as we need. We get a little bit of feedback if we get too many mics on at the same time. But um, so this is for open discussion. Um, so just as you think about your questions, I'll, I'll start with one question to the panel just to, to get things moving. Um, so we've heard a lot um, this morning about um, that the world seems to reward um, people who take risks and rebound. So this resilience issue. Um, so I was wondering if I could ask the panel what your thoughts are um, on, on what you think we can do to support women uh, to be able to more safely take risks and to develop that resilience. And, and probably thinking as well how we as in, in workplaces can support that. Would anybody like to start on that? Um, shall I pick on Linda actually? Because <laughs> it came up I think particularly in your talk. Yeah, I, I think in terms of supporting women in the workplace, I think I've, I'm a huge believer in mentors. Um, I've had some amazing mentors. I've been very lucky to, and I love mentoring. Um, I think it's key, and, and, and what it does, I think, is is it allows you to, to kind of, number one, a safe space to kind of wobble, which is important because we all do. Number two, I think it, it gives you a sense of where you, you, know, you can be, that this, this stuff is possible. And I think thirdly, and really importantly, you know, it normalizes this idea that you don't have to go it alone. And I think for a lot of us, when we're you know, in our respective fields, you know, whether you're kind of, I was speaking to someone who was the first, what were, the first woman in um, shipping, to build a shipping company, am I right? That's Michelle. <laughs> It's the, it should be the button, the button on its own beside the mic. Yeah. Um, no, first lady to run a port for 900 years. First lady to run a port for 900 years. Like, cool. Wow. <laughs> so I think this idea of, you know, when you are doing something that you do feel alone and that kind of mentoring is key. So I think if I was to give one, you know, piece of it, I think for me it would be mentoring. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, any other comments? Yeah, happy. Uh, I think the other thing is um, we have to create safe spaces for women to tell their stories and share their experiences. To, I think the sense making is really important. So it is that thing of, is this me? Um, so that internal locus of control I shouldn't have, I did the wrong thing. Um, and when we're in those safe spaces, so you know some of the programs we've run, mentoring, that sort of women's network where you can challenge, am I seeing this properly? Is there another way I should be looking at this? And often it's when you hear someone else's story that you then reflect on how you usually do that. And it's a bit like, because you're seeing the distress in them and thinking that's not a good way or that's not right. Well, like, they've got that all wrong. It helps you reflect on, am I doing that? So I think those safe spaces are something that organisationally we have to um, make sure we've got. 
Okay, we'll probably just move on. We'll, we'll come to, well, I've got another question up my sleeve for Gail. Uh, so Jenny, you were waiting to ask a question? Yeah, this maybe actually leads on from, from what you've said, because I just wondered about the role that networks had played in your career. So one of the things that I found is I had a light bulb moment a couple of years ago when I was linked into a network where I started to question why I didn't think I could do things. So I just made assumptions about how I, and then people were challenging those assumptions and, and it was being linked into this particular network. So I just wondered how networks of women or peers or whatever has played a part in your development. Gail? It's almost like you're reading my paper. I've written networks down. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that so I'm just linking to resilience part, like networks are really important and it's realising not just what network you've got, but how can you be part of somebody else's network? Um, and you, you can play like a really vital role in giving somebody that bit of encouragement. If you see that somebody, that particularly another woman or a girl is feeling down, like what can you do that is going to, to act as that safe space for them? Um, and I think also if you're in a position of authority or management, it's really like critical to understand that there are three things that you have to do. Three things that I think um, as a manager you can think about. One is um, uh, it's fixing things. Second is brainstorming, but actually most of the time it's listening. It's being that sort of safe space and, and being part of a part of somebody's network. So I, like, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, that networks are really, really critical. And I'm just to say something a bit positive about social media. One of the th so what I'm working on at the moment is messaging and messaging groups. And what we found is that like people's WhatsApp groups or messenger groups are really critical to being part of that safe space. So being able to say to somebody. I'm not quite sure about this. What is it? Am I am I listening this the right way? Am I am I doing it? Feeling that you're doing it in a safe space, and then getting that level of support, saying, "Yeah, you're doing great. It's brilliant." Really makes a difference. Other comments, Lindley? Yeah, I I think networks are really critical, and I think there's different networks. There's the, sort of the professional work ones. I think it's also really important, particularly as you move into more senior roles, to have. A, a good support network around you, the sort of people that you can ring and say, let's have a coffee now. Um, and it's not that you actually want coffee. They know what that code is for. <laughs> Often it's good wine and dark chocolate, um, <laughs> and that's equally okay. Um, but I also think that it's important to have people who, who you can trust to tell you what you need to hear, not, as, not only what you want to hear. So someone who would be honest with you about actually you were out of line then, you didn't do that as well as you might have, and not in that pejorative way, but in that way that helps you go, yeah, I felt really bad about that, what can I do better? So I think there's the professional networks and then that support network that you choose very carefully to have those, some of those conversations with. Hilda? Hi there. Um, You've all raised some really interesting points about the different behavioural patterns of men and women and even the way we bring boys and girls up in different ways. Um, and the point about moving goalposts was particularly interesting. But you could argue that the goalposts haven't been set by a neutral referee but actually by men. So to what extent should women be trying to emulate men's behaviour and to what extent should we actually be celebrating the way we approach things? A oh, great question. Who would like to start? Linda's moved forward. Perfect. <laughs> um, I, yeah, that's a brilliant question. <sighs> Look, I, I think we're, we're at a place where we have opportunity, right? An opportunity to kind of learn from what's worked and from what hasn't worked. It's not that everything doesn't work, and sometimes it very much is to the underside of the same coin as we were seeing right it's you know you know feedback can be very good or very bad mentoring can work very well or can make you stifle depending on who's doing it so I, for me i'm a nerd at heart right um i think there's a lot of conjecture out there which is great i think conjecture leads to great discussion but i think we now are having more evidence-based approaches about what works or where we don't i think we need to figure it out so for me i think this is a time to 
kind of go back, look at what is working for both men and women, because we need to do this together. This can't be, you know, you had your turn, now it's ours. That ain't going to fly, and I don't think it should. I don't think that's how we get quality. But at the same time, I think we need to kind of revert back to the academics, to the approach, to the social scientists that are kind of looking into this and, and restructure things. And I think also really importantly, and again, I guess this is a shrink in me, is sort of I kind of look at when I'm trying to solve a problem, you know, I, I, first I look at it as, you know, uh, from the individual, then I look at it in terms of their family, then I look at it in terms of society, then I look at it, you know, in wider terms politically. And I think that's how we have to look at this. So, you know, to speak about conflict or confidence, we can speak about this, you know, someone sitting in my office across from me, we can talk about that as an individual, but then we can look at how that plays out at the wider level and then eventually at those top echelons. And again, I feel it needs to be evidence-based. Yeah, I, I think, um, so you, should we be more like men or should we be, or should we be trying to just be ourselves? I think that, I mean, just to, to sort of build on what Linda was saying, that we have seen some advancement in terms of like getting to, to a society where we can value women um, more. And I think we've also seen like the point that you made at the start, it's not just about um, saying to women, you know, we need to value you. It's also about saying to men, it's okay to, to be at home. It's okay to uh, to be to take responsibility for for your family. And it was that. Like, I mean, I'd, it might sound like a sort of like glib soundbite when I was saying that when I was holding my daughter and saying, I don't want you to have to be quiet. I really strongly felt I want my son to take some responsibility. Not that I thought that there weren't men in my life that were taking responsibility. I just knew I didn't want him thinking that all those sort of small things. I think when you when you've got a family and you're thinking about others, you're thinking about all the time. And in our house, it was socks. I like, remember having this argument with my husband, thinking, "Are you thinking about the fact that our son's socks don't fit anymore?" And he was like, "What are you talking about?" And I was like. That's what I was trying to like. I was trying to work out like this thinking about other people, and I remember like really vividly thinking, "I want my son um, to take responsibility." And I think we are starting to see some of that change in society. So things like sheer parental leave make a massive difference. So that like knowing what it's like to look after children, knowing that you have some responsibility um, for others around you, really does make a difference. And I think you're all, we're also starting to see some of those changes in the workplace. And I know like I'm. I'm, I'm in an organisation that is led by one of the world's um, uh, like leading feminists. And it's, you know, it's, I, I think there is a lot in Facebook. We're thinking a lot about like emotional intelligence. We're far from perfect, but we're also thinking about what role, what role do, do men play in terms of what women can do. So I think we're starting to see that, starting to see that recognition that it's not about being the sort of like the butch, um, like what was it, pantsuit that wearing that they say in the US. Like it's not about trying to pretend to be a man. But I still think that we're, you know, when when push comes to shove, and you see this right now in the democratic um, primaries, we still tend to default um, to men being leaders. So we've still got a long way to go. Perfect. A question right at the back. Great. Thank you for all of your lovely um, contributions today. Um, I have a question regarding confidence. Um, which has been addressed by a few of you. And I guess one, it's confidence. I'm a current PhD student who lacks lots of confidence. I didn't want to ask this question. Um, <laughs> but so confidence in entering an academic sphere and wanting to, to stay in it. However, not having confidence in the sphere that you're entering because like has been said, it is built in a sense for men. And so in many ways, it's not a sphere that I want to enter as it is. Um, so I was curious, and maybe this is somewhat addressed in the recent question, but if there are thoughts on, I don't know, advices or suggestions for a person in that, in that area. Lindley, do you want to start? Um, I think it's important to find the conversation you want your work to be part of. So sometimes we look at you know, some of the dominant discourse in, in particular disciplines, and I don't know what discipline area you're in, and we think we've got to be part of that conversation, and that's not a welcoming place. So I think sometimes it's around finding who do, who do I want to play with? Who are the people who I want to have a proper intellectual challenge with? One of my closest friends 
is a, a feminist economist, and um, she's you know got a fantastic reputation, and she has unashamedly talked about women's issues and challenged theory, economic theory, you know, rational behaviour, all of those sorts of areas, and said there is another way we can look at this, and there are big arguments within the group that that she speaks with, but it's also a safe place to be intellectually rigorous. So you're not having to fight that battle as well as, you know, I want to pursue this line of thought, I think there is something that we can make. So I think it is around having a supportive network, it is around finding the conversation that you want to be part of, it is around that question of, uh, you know, what's the worst that can happen? The other question I always ask myself is, what am I afraid of? And often when I work that through, I can see that it's not a very rational fear. And so that gives me the courage to take some steps into those conversations that I want to influence, that I want to change. And I'm happy to leave some of those other ones. That's someone else's battle. I don't have to fight them all. Linda? Um, I would also say, you know, Find a sense of entitlement. If you're a PhD student, that means you are researching an area that no one else in the whole world is researching, right? Not in the way that you are. So I think kind of being able to, to, to lead from that. I always say this to my PhD students, my doctoral students, like this, this sense of entitlement and this idea that, you know, why not you? Why anyone else? Why not you? There, there's something really important about the assumption of, you know, this. there's something in psychology called imposter syndrome. You heard of this? Mm -hmm. It's this idea that we don't deserve our success. And you have everyone from Maya Angelou down kind of saying that they have imposter syndrome. And again, we tend to see this in women. Well, why not? I mean, you clearly, you know, you, it's not an accident that you were selected to be a PhD candidate. It's not an accident that you are still in it and buying it. Clearly, you have what it takes. And it's, it's really important to gain that sense of, of, um, of, you know, entitlement around it. And I think also, I think there's, there's something really important about kind of being able to laugh. I'll give you an example. I was... Um, I was uh, when I was a very young course director at the university, so I'd always end up um, at these meetings where there would tend to be, much, you know, people that were much older than me that were course directors, mostly men. And I, invariably, I get asked for coffee. This was about 20 years ago. If I could go get. Now, there was a couple of other young male professors, but they would never get asked to make the coffee. So I had two choices there, right? I could get very offended and think, or. I could hold up a mirror to what was happening and get the, get the people that were asking for coffee. Because I don't think they were asking me for coffee because they were idiots or chauvinists. Or, I think it was just, it's the system they were born into. You, you know, you have breasts, you're younger, you're probably the person making, very sadly, that's what it was at the time. So I learned to get people on side, to kind of be kind in terms of sort of allowing them to change. When, when they didn't change, that was <laughs> different. But you give an opportunity and actually, People then, you'd be surprised how they come and they'll, you know, they want to learn, they want to be lifted up. And I think this is, I think, a conversation we need to be having more of. I think because we're seeing a lot of this rushing to judgment of like the, the worst reason someone sort of says the wrong term to you or uses the wrong, most of us don't want to kind of subjugate each other in these environments. So, you know, number one, sense of entitlement. Number two, kind of learn to deal with, you know, being someone different in that environment. Number three, get people on side. And I have no doubt you'll do brilliant. Yep. So I'm, I'm actually going to ask you, Marion, to answer that question because we were talking about this last night over dinner, how you stepped into an environment that wasn't the one that you... It feels like it's exactly that question and how you changed it. Because you've been pretty successful. I think so, but... <laughs> oh, gosh, putting on this one. Um, I, I think it's all the same things. I think you have to say, what am I afraid of? And actually, what's the worst that can happen? And, and you know, sometimes you just say, well, actually, I do want to do it. So... You know, you've just got to go out and own it, I think, um, and, and be aware that actually if you fail, it's not the end of the world, and we all make mistakes, and you just get up and you go, okay, um, that's fine, you know, maybe I did look a fool, but, you know, you move on. The worst that can happen is somebody talks about it for five minutes, and then you move on. And I think you actually, once you then do get success, then it, it, it does breed a bit of self-confidence. You say, well, actually, I do know more about certain things than other people, 
And just own that. I mean, you will be out of your comfort zone. I still am out of my comfort zone and many, many times. It doesn't go away, but you learn how to handle it. And I think, you know, a, a lot of, I think, what we've heard today is, you know, don't let your doubts stop you. Just go for it and, and, and really just own it. It's life's for living, I think, is my response to that. Unfortunately, we're getting near, yeah, I'm getting the move on sign um, from the back. Um, I, I, I think we could sit and talk all day. Um, and um, we will have opportunity to talk with the speakers after as we move on their speed mentoring this afternoon. Um, but I just want to finish up um, this part of the day by thanking our speakers. Um, I think they've been truly wonderful. And, and so a round of applause for the speakers first. <laughs> And really, I've been writing down little notes to myself this morning, and, and one of them was one that I just fed back to you. The thing I think we collectively need to do is don't let our doubts stop us. Um, I think we all need to con conscientiously think about turning beliefs into action. We all know what we want to do. We know what we're capable of. We just need to make it happen. We need to accept that good enough is good enough. We don't need to be perfect in everything. And I think, above all, we seize the day. And we go out there and, and we make it happen. And we also tell people to share responsibility for finding the socks. That's the top point for today. So we're going to wrap up the day with a very inspirational uh, performance. Um, if I'd like to invite Killer Quines to come down to the front. So this is our uh, university's only all-female group uh, made up of University of Aberdeen students. Welcome, guys. Lovely to see you. Um, Killer Quines, for anybody not from the Northeast, Quine is women, girl. Killer Quines are a, a renowned a cappella group that recently took part in the Scottish A Cappella Championships in Edinburgh. So, this is an uplifting way to finish our performance. Over to you guys.
superb. Now that is confidence personified. And on that note, um, I was listening to them. Come take my hand. I wouldn't let you go. That's what we need to do as women, link together and go forward and uh, flourish. So on that note, um, let's go to lunch. Thank you very much.